Hope it's okay with you if I do a little uh, multitasking here tonight. I, I haven't had an opportunity to exercise like I typically want to. So I thought I would kind of add in some, use this time in, in multiple ways. So one of the things, and we just kind of experienced this uh, a few minutes ago, was um, in our culture, one of the most common greetings that we have for each other is to simply ask someone the question, how are you doing? see somebody on the street or, or run into a friend, we typically say that. And, and more often than not, we'll respond with, I'm doing well or, or not bad. And then we, we return the question to them, how are you? It's, it's a cultural courtesy that we give to one another. But what happens when the conversation continues? In my role as a youth pastor, I began to notice over the last several years that that the most common response that I would hear from students when I asked them the question, how are you, specifically if I kind of pressed a little bit, if, if I got beyond sort of that initial first response, I would often hear them stop and say things like, I'm so stressed out. Like, like I, I'm exhausted or I, I can't keep up with it all or, or I'm overwhelmed. And Initially, I sort of just reacted and said, well, this is just high school students. They're dramatic, you know, by nature. And, and, but I realized that they weren't being dramatic at all. They were being honest. Furthermore, what I began to notice was that I was hearing that response not only from students, but I was seeing myself. When somebody was asking me, how are you doing? And often, I'm just I'm really stressed right now or I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I was hearing it from other adults. I felt like I was beginning to hear it everywhere. And maybe this is something that you've noticed as well. Last week, if you were here with us, we began a series here at FBCG entitled The Story of God. Our study of Genesis and Exodus, our look at this redemptive narrative from the very outset, at, at God working and moving from the very beginning and how it all leads us to the person and work of, of Jesus Christ. And last week, we looked at Genesis 1, this incredible song of creation that reveals the God who creates with the power of his word, where, where God's glory is displayed throughout the universe, where God creates because he is a God of love, because he is relational. I mentioned last week in Genesis chapter 1 that there is a cadence, a, a rhythm to it. it. It builds and there's this pinnacle where the language changes and, and God out of dust forms humanity. And unique, unlike the rest of creation now, God does something different. He embeds into his creation his own image. Join us next uh, next weekend. Uh, Pastor Jeff is going to elaborate on that aspect of the passage even further, but as it comes to this point, God looks at that which he has created and he said, it is very good. This is where we pick things up in the story. This is at the end of the first chapter of Genesis. Genesis 1 verse 31, you'll see the passage up on the, the screen. It says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Here in Genesis 1, in the midst of all of this creative activity of God, this seemingly escalating and, and advancing work of God, it arrives at this climactic moment. He forms humanity. He breathes life into it. He embeds his image and then... There's rest, there is pause, there's peace, there is 
Sabbath. Let's take a moment then to contrast this to what we described just a few moments earlier, this trend when, when we're asked the question, how are you to have a default answer that is increasingly one of exhaustion, of depletion, where the pace is ever increasing, when our activity is on top of obligation and on top of responsibility. In our culture, we'll use phrases all the time like less is more, but our lives are shouting that more is more. We wake up earlier. We stay up later. We, we move from one activity to the other, from work to soccer practice and from piano recital to the PTO meeting. We layer and layer and layer activity on top of work, on top of responsibility into our lives and the pace is ever increasing to the point where we struggle to catch our breath. The point to which if we make one wrong move, the crash is inevitable and all of it, it's, it's very unstable. In our lives, we have a tendency to jump from one treadmill to the other. From the treadmill of work to the treadmill of family to the treadmill of recreation. All of it, we kind of move from one thing to the another and, and at the heart of it there's this need to merely stop, to, to catch our breath, to meet with the very God who from the beginning in creation created rest, created Sabbath, created a place for us to step off the treadmill, to just meet with him. We see it in the beginning, here in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. As we get into this passage, as we think about what God teaches us here, what he is revealing to us in these words, there are a couple of things that I just want to point out. As God here in, in his design and in his creation, his purpose, he includes Sabbath rest. And how do we experience it? What does it look like for you and I to, to stop, to rest, to be found in him? Let's begin by looking at the creation of rest. The creation of rest. Typically, when I think about the seventh day of creation, I have thought to myself, well, God's all done now. Uh, and so he rests. But to, to view it this way misses, I think, an important and fundamental point. You may have noticed that the text here reads, on the seventh day God finished his work. It doesn't say on the sixth day God finished his work, but on the seventh, and I've missed this previously, but God's creative activity does not conclude with the creation of mankind. It concludes... It wraps up with the creation of rest. This is an important distinction for us. God did not finish his work and then rest, but rest is a part of his work. It is a part of his creative activity. It is the completion of it. The implication here is significant. God's creation all along the way um, is marked with, with design and purpose. It isn't an afterthought or, or a tag on. It has intention and purpose. I don't know if this is theologically accurate or not, but sometimes when I imagine God's creative activity, I, I picture like my kids playing with their Legos. And I have three daughters. For most of their lives, they, they, Legos were kind of oriented and designed for boys, but in the last few years, they've been marketing Legos to, um, to girls. Um, and so they've gotten into it, which has been a real answer for prayer for me, because um, I just love playing with Legos. And so now we have them in our home. And, and one of the things I love, you know, they make all these kits and they design all these cool things. But I love when my kids just sort of like free design, free play, and, and take those things. And they're not assembling something that is done by instructions, but they're creating something out of their own sort of idea in their head. And oftentimes it'll look like modern art, you know, like there's no sense... 
But if you sit down with one of my daughters and talk about what they just made, they'll tell you what everything does. Oh, Dad, this is an elevator that takes you from the aqua level to the sky level. And, and it may not look like that, or it may not, but everything that they include there has purpose and intention and design. It's all a part of this aspect of, of their imagination. And so as we enter into this creation narrative, we need to understand that God here is creating out of purpose and intention. God does not stop on day seven because he is weary. God's work of, of creation has not depleted him or overwhelmed him. Rather, God creates out of intention and design. And from the very point, from the very beginning, God places a rhythm to this life. From engagement to rest, from activity to, to pause, stop, to be with him, to get off the treadmill, to, to just be, to be present. It's all there from the very beginning. And have you ever stopped to ask yourself the question, what, what was God doing on day seven? And what was he doing? I think as I have processed this, I think he was doing the same thing that, that he was doing prior to Genesis 1-1. He was existing in, in perfect love and in, in, in unity and in perfect community with the triune God, with the Holy Spirit and, and the Son. I think he is, in creating rest, he creates relational space. What existed now in eternity past, what he had in the triune God, he's now made available to Adam and Eve and to all of us, and that is simply to be with him. God's creation of the Sabbath reveals its design and purpose. In verse 3 it read, so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. The creation account may culminate, it may, it's this climactic moment on day six, but it does not conclude there. It's day seven that God calls holy, that it says is set apart. It is an indication of the significance now of, of God's rest, of what he's made available to us, And as he's entering into this resting place at the completion of the cosmos, it reveals this, this understanding of the sovereign Lord who is enthroned in this temple that he has now created, who is ruling over his creation. The psalmist in Psalm 104 uses this very same language, this understanding of the God who creates. This is the beginning of Psalm 104. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beam of his chambers on the water and he makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind and he makes his messengers winds and ministers a flaming fire. Here the psalmist is using the language of creation to reveal the enthroned king who is ruling over that which he has created and who does so with all power and might, and yet he is the one who is relational, who invites us in. This leads us then to the question or to the point of what is that purpose? If it's created with design, if it's created with intention, then what is the purpose of rest? And to be fair, there's, there's a lot that we could say on this topic. The practice of, of Sabbath is integrated into the, the faith and the worship of the people of God throughout the Old Testament. We see it evident everywhere. In our, in our time today, however, what I want to look at is I want us to get a sense of the overarching aspects of God's purposeful creation of rest. And it's interesting to note that this is one of the fundamental areas, the point of conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees in the New Testament was on Jesus' adherence observance of, of Sabbath law and how he, how he demonstrated it. In, uh, in Mark chapter 2, and, and, and just as a note, throughout the history of 
Israel, they became very strict in their law about what it meant, what it looked like to observe Sabbath, to participate in Sabbath rest, to the point where they essentially made rest work, where it became work in order to rest. So in Mark chapter 2, when Jesus' disciples are, are gleaning grain in order to eat on the Sabbath day, and the Pharisees come to Jesus to question him about what his disciples are doing, Jesus responds and says, the, and says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Essentially, he's saying, you're missing the point. You're missing the purpose. I think there's a couple key elements about what Jesus has here that's important for us to understand. And first and foremost, it's that Sabbath is intended to be restorative. Rest is meant for in our lives to be restorative. Jesus' words here in the Gospel of Mark capture this. God in his divine wisdom and his provision both knew our need and created the means to provide for it. If we are to think of the Sabbath as intentional and purposeful, as this set-apart time to meet with God, to be in relationship with him, to be cared for by him, then we begin to capture the restorative nature of Sabbath rest. What God has designed and intended, created with purpose for us. Just this week, as, as I was preparing to preach a sermon on rest, Pastor Jeff had planned on Thursday morning to um, have a staff chapel. And if I'm being completely honest, I came somewhat... Um, begrudgingly, I don't, if that's the right word, frustrated maybe a little bit. Because I wanted to, I wanted to work on my sermon. I, I kind of had set some time, a tie, uh, some time aside to, to write and to prepare and do all that. So I had to, I'd come over to, to East Campus and, and Jeff had created space for us as, as the FBCG staff to, to take communion together and to um, hear from God's word, just a, a, a meditative sort of devotional that, that he led to, to worship together. And I could, I could feel, I could feel my heart filling up. I mean, maybe you know that, that feeling, but I, my need was evident and the, the app, the time set apart, space to meet with him, ability to meet that need was, need was overwhelming for me to the point where it was, it was emotional. And I, I was, humiliated at one level that I was preparing a sermon on Sabbath and I didn't recognize that the value of this time that that Jeff had created for us and I was frustrated I was frustrated because I've been in this place before where where I have really others I should say have set us part time for me to be alone with God in many ways and I've been in that place and I've recognized the value what it what it creates, and I always think to myself, I'm going to be better at this. I'm going to make space for this. And here I was, once again, kind of in that place where I didn't, I didn't see it, and I hadn't been there. But it was so restorative for me, and I think for others as well. Maybe you've been in a similar place. See, God has called us to kingdom work. He's called us to be ambassadors, his ambassadors here on earth. He calls us to give away of our time and our resources and our energy, but he has not designed you and I to function on empty. He has not designed us to stay on the treadmill continuously. He has designed us Quite the contrary, so that we are giving, that we are acting out of the overflow of what he provides for us. And we so often neglect this. Rest in him is meant to restore us, to provide for us, to fill us up so that we can continue to give to others. I love the words of Jesus from, from Matthew chapter 11. He says in verse 28 through 30, he says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest 
in your souls. Jesus invites us to experience the restorative rest that only he can provide. And as Jesus is saying this word, he shows us another element or aspect of, of this rest that we're talking about. And that is simply that Sabbath rest is redemptive. The word here that we translate rest literally means to cease striving. Just as physical exhaustion, like moments when we have to catch our breath, reveal our physical limits and, and our physical needs, our attempts and our, and our failures to make ourselves right with God out of our own effort, this, this perfect, this set-apart God, our attempts and failures to, to reconcile ourselves to Him because of what we accomplished, they reveal our spiritual need, and more importantly, they reveal the One who provides rest. The one in whom we are able to cease striving. In the book of, of Hebrews, which is just one of my favorite books that I've gone back to time and time again in my life. But one of the, the passages that's so important, that the author of Hebrews is really looking to take so much of what is, is the aspects of Jewish faith and Jewish life that they have known and grown up with. And he, he points how they find their fulfillment in Christ and just this elegant and, and, and poetic, really powerful way. And he does this on the topic of, of Sabbath. This is chapter 4 at the beginning of the chapter. He says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. He goes on to say in verse 9, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Sabbath is, is ultimately and completely to be found in Christ. The author of Hebrews is, is leading his readers to enter into Sabbath rest that is offered through Jesus Christ and, and through what he has accomplished on the cross. Therein can I, can I cease my spiritual striving and I can be found in the one who offers rest. So let me ask you a question. Are you spiritually exhausted? Are you striving in your own effort? Are you depleted and worn out and ready to give up? Because if that is you today, may I invite you to experience the Sabbath rest that is offered in Jesus. This, this restorative and redemptive rest that's made available to you and I on the cross. Because that is available to you here today. Thirdly, then, I want to take just a few moments to consider the experience of rest. The experience of rest. And if you're anything like me, your mind automatically, automatically goes to the question of how. Well, how do I do this? How do I rest? What do I need to do in order to experience rest? Do you even hear the irony there? It's like, what do I need to do in order to rest. But that's where my mind goes. And if you look throughout the history of Israel and through church history, there has been a tendency to take God's provision of rest and to include or to exercise it in human effort. So we can so quickly almost become legalistic about, about what it means to, to experience rest. And that only serves to become counterproductive. We just make it another treadmill. And that's not God's design or intention. And when I think about this, it helps me to think about God's idea of Sabbath, his, his rest as, as not only instructive, but also as an invitation. Sabbath rest is more than having a day off. It's more than vacation or, or just taking it easy. It's more than putting my feet up on a Sunday afternoon and watching the football game. Sabbath rest is intentional, it's purposeful, it's time set apart to meet with God. It can and I think it should 
include corporate experiences where we worship together and we hear from God's word and much like that staff chapel that Jeff created this week, how that ministered to and fed my soul. We experienced that together, but I also think there's times, private sort of solo moments where we allow God to care for our soul because he knows our very need. He knows what we need from him and he provides for those needs that we can rest in him. And so as I think about what does it mean for you and I to experience Sabbath rest, I would like to ask you to consider a few questions. To consider where and when and how you experience rest. And, and I want you to just, as, as I ask these, I want you to take a moment just to process this. To allow this to kind of sink in if we can. When and where are you particularly in tune to the voice of God? Where can you hear him most clearly? What does that look like for you? When and where has God seemed closest to you? Most evident. His, his work is, is clearest. Where do you experience that? What do you find refreshing and, and restorative? How have you experienced that in the past? And then lastly, when and where can you set aside a time and place for the exclusive, undistracted purpose of meeting with God? to experience, to be in relationship with the very God who created you, who formed us out of the dust. Because here's the thing. You and I need it. We need it. We need Him. In His creation, He designed, He created space for rest. Space where we would cease our striving and just be with him. God created, he established a rhythm for us. And he invites us into it. May we be found in the Sabbath rest that is only available to us when we meet with the one who created us who designed us, and who desires to spend time with us. May we experience that and know that firsthand as we continue to be in relationship with him. Would you pray with me? Jesus, you, you are a relational God and you have invited us into relationship with you and you have created space where we can stop doing and where we can just be. We can just be with you where you tend to our very souls. So God, I pray even this evening that we would step off the treadmill. That we would create moments and days and times where where we set apart everything else just to be with you. And we know that you wait for us there. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.